and CFD credit. And there are information sheets at the registration desk to tell you how to go about getting that credit. Um, if you are watching by the live stream, the video stream, and you would like to ask a question or make a comment, there is a chat button. Uh, it says chat. It's the bottom of your screen. Just click on that and enter your question. We will be monitoring those throughout the program. Uh, if you are participating by the live stream, it would be very helpful to us for us to know your location, city and state, uh, the organization you're with, and it's optional for you to put your name and job title. And uh, if you are seeking the continuing education credit and you're participating by live stream, we will need your email address so we can send you the information on how to get that credit. Uh, there uh, are two links here that you will be able to see throughout the program. The link to the agenda and the program is on the left, and the link to the Division of Securities website is on the right. And through that Division of Securities website, you can find the crowdfunding rules that we'll be discussing today. If you have any questions or comments after the program is over, on page seven, the last page of the agenda program, there's an email address for the Division of Securities where you can present your question. And now I'd like to introduce the Securities Commissioner for the Colorado Division of Securities, and he will explain the program in a little more detail, Jerry Rowe. Thank you. Thanks, Ira. Thanks for that introduction. And, and thank you and the business school here at the University of Colorado Denver for providing the facilities for holding this important forum for us. Um, as a securities commissioner in Colorado, I'm charged with administering the Colorado Securities Act. Um, and in the Colorado Securities Act, the state legislature has told us what the purpose of the Securities Act is. And, and it, it comes in three parts. And the state legislature said that our job at the division is one, to protect investors, um, two, maintain confidence in the securities markets here in Colorado, and three, not impose unreasonable burdens on the capital markets here. While our enforcement actions are civil and criminal enforcement actions against the securities law violators, and they grab the headlines here, um, we are much more than that. The importance, our focus is on, includes the, import, the importance of the capital markets here to maintain both a vibrant and, and uh, growing economy. Is that focus, which we used back in 2015, when we teamed up with State Representative Dan Perbaum and State Representative Pete Lee, and, and together we put together the Colorado Crowdfunding Act. And we'll talk a little bit about what crowdfunding is and what's in the act. But uh, in April of 2015, that legislature, legislation made it through the legislature and was signed uh, by Governor Hickman in April of 2015. The act became effective in August of 2015. Following all the excitement and buzz that we encountered when the uh, Colorado Crowdfunding Act became effective, it all went quiet. It was sort of it was all quiet on the crowdfunding front. Um, we know that um, crowdfunding has been successful in other states. Um, it's been successful on the federal level. And the question is, why, why is it not working here in Colorado? Um, the purpose of the forum is to attempt to flesh out the answers to that important question for us. Um, I want to thank all our panel members uh, that are here today participating to help us find some of the answers. And I also want to thank uh, Monica Mendoza uh, for being the panel moderator for us. Um, as we all know, Monica Mendoza is the business reporter at the Denver Business Journal. She covers banking and finance, the economy and the retail industry. Um, some of the issues she's covered recently have been the SEC rules. She's uh, reported extensively on crowdfunding here in Colorado. Um, the DOL fiduciary duty rule um, and the new um, blockchain technology that is you know, growing and emerging issue here in Colorado. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Monica, and thank you for willing to do this today. Well, as I mentioned, that a 
couple of years ago, I wrote a story that said, equity crowdfunding, will it be a boom or a bust? And <laughs> I like the way you put it, it's been a little quiet. So I'm looking forward to hearing what our students will say about all this, but I'd like to introduce them one by one. And um, I'm going to start with Eric. Um, uh, Eric Woodstone has been practicing law in Colorado since 1978, and he's currently a shareholder and managing director at Burns, Vega and Will. And he practices in areas of business transactions, um, including corporate law, federal and state security compliance, mergers and acquisitions, contract law, tax law, real estate, and zoning. And I met him back on a plane right after you know, being in D.C. for um, talking about the Jobs Act, the Federal Equity um, Crowdfunding Act, and came here and we chatted a lot about Colorado um, Crowdfunding Act. So that's here. Please, um, we'll help you hear about what uh, the law has in store for us. Next, we have Professor Andrew Short. He joined Colorado Law faculty in 2008 and um, has been a full professor since 2017. Right? Um, he teaches and publishes on corporate, securities, and contract law. And he was recently uh, a Fulbright Research Scholar and Visiting Professor at the Institute Law School in New Zealand. So we're looking forward to hearing about how they are using their um, crowdfunding law and enterprise businesses. Is that what you said? Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, next we have... Uh, Jack Donfeld, he's a securities lawyer. Um, he, he and his Boulder firm, Donfeld Law, serve startup and emerging businesses, venture capital, and private equity groups. Um, he is also a co-founder and managing partner of Boomtown Accelerator, which you might have heard of. And we're looking forward to hearing how some entrepreneurs may or may not be interested in equity crowdfunding. So um, it's going to be a great discussion. And finally, we have... Um, Carl Dakin, he's been um, in, in basically in this business for like 38 years. <laughs> he's um, an educator, a communicator, and an entrepreneur with, and small business advocate. So he's an expert in entrepreneurship, technology, commercialization, and uh, an expert in capital formation. So we're looking forward to hearing about um, equity crowdfunding and what your thoughts are there. So uh, he's also a principal in Dayton Capital Guild and Invest Local Colorado, which we're going to hear about. That's one of the platforms that has been approved on our SEC site so that they can start taking some, um, start having some longer. So without further ado, <laughs> let's get going, everyone. Uh, I like that we're going to start calling this like round one and round two of like boxing. boxing. So, I'm going to ask, I know we can talk about all of this for hours, but I'm going to ask that maybe we keep our answers a little quickly, and that way we have the type of questions at the end. So, I'm going to start with Carl. Um, I'm hoping, uh, we all know about Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and those are really rewards crowdfunding sites. So maybe you can give us an explanation of what equity crowdfunding is and how it's different from those reward sites that we all know about. So thank you. Um, uh, I prepared several hours of presentation for tonight. I'm keeping it short. Uh, but if you want to see my full commentary, you can go to the investlocalcolorado.com site, and you'll get more information about my thoughts on today's topic. Uh, investment crowdfunding is a step above, uh, depends on how you look at it, either one, two, or 10 steps above what are called rewards crowdfunding, Indiegogo, Kickstarter which is only selling a product. It's a temporary relationship which occurs during the exchange where somebody puts money up and gets a product or service back. When you get into investment crowdfunding, you're talking about a investment in a business or an organization or a project that has a longer term relationship and there's a potential for you to get your money back above and beyond what you put into it, which makes it a security and puts it under regulatory structures both at the federal and state level. So it's a much more complex form of raising money. It has much more potential. Uh, the size of dollars that are raised are uh, typically in the hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars as opposed to seven to $15,000. Uh, 
and it is a big deal because it opens up a new industry or a new approach to raising capital, which previously was unavailable to small businesses and gives them now a lot of opportunities they didn't have before. Question here about um, who really, really helped draft the Colorado Property Act. And so I'm hoping that you can give us a little explanation for us non lawyers out in the group here about how the basic process works. A basic process in Colorado uh, works pretty much as uh, Carl suggested, which is equity based crowdfunding. If you're an investor, uh, it's subject to regulation by federal and state securities laws, and that's where a lot of the complexities come in. The other piece of the complexity becomes in what Carl referred to as the long-term relationship, because all of a sudden the issuer, the person selling the securities in the crowdfunding offer, uh, has investors and maybe hundreds of investors with whom the issuer has to keep in communication, uh, before they take the investment, the uh, issuer has to qualify to ensure that they meet the crowdfunding requirements. The crowdfunding requirements are really threefold. One is the issuer, and uh, the when the Crowd Colorado Crowdfunding Act was originally written, it was based on uh, Securities and Exchange Commission Rule 147, which is the intrastate offering. Colorado issuers, Colorado people spending the money in Colorado. Um, and uh, in uh, this year, uh, I think in May of this year, um, the federal rule 147A became effective, which broadened the scope of uh, who you could uh, offer to, and the commissioner included that in the new rules that was enacted in, uh, I guess they were published in July of 2017. So that makes it broader. One of the issues in the original Rule 147 is you couldn't advertise out of state. Well, crowdfunding is a uh, online advertising, so that makes life a little difficult. There were workarounds, but when you're talking about workarounds, you're talking about getting lawyers involved, and like it or not, we cost money. Uh, the second piece of the um, crowdfund or crowdfunding act is the investor. The investor has got to meet certain qualifications. The investor, if not an accredited investor, is limited to uh, what the investor can contribute, uh, can invest in the issuer, and the investor has to establish Colorado residency uh, before the investment can be taken. And um, then finally, the third uh, leg on which this crowdfunding stool has been built on is the uh, broker dealer slash online intermediary. The beauty of the online intermediary is that it doesn't have to go through all of the broker-dealer qualifications, which is one of the big differences from the Federal Crowdfunding Act, which brings in too much of the uh, federal broker-dealer registration. But on the other hand, it also limits the uh, online intermediary to uh, compensation that's not based on the amount of the offering um, raised, not based on the investors brought to the table. Well, let, let me just uh, briefly just say, uh, uh, you know, how happy I am to be here. Um, I know that um, our provost and our chancellor and the whole system uh, really encourages uh, interdisciplinary um, inter-campus uh, uh, engagement. So uh, I was very pleased to be invited here, so thank you. Um, yes, I mean, as Herrick said, um, the states are free uh, as long as they keep everything intra-state to create their own scheme of securities regulation separate from the federal scheme. 
And, and we did that here along with a few other uh, dozen, a few dozen uh, other states. Um, what we drafted um, uh, you know, several years ago and, and enacted is, uh, by and large, very similar to the federal Jumpstart Our Business Startups, Jobs Act, uh, which was, uh, as you said, signed by President Obama in 2012. So um, if you're a company, uh, and now it turned out you were right that the uh, Colorado and other states were getting a little antsy. By the time we actually enacted this and, and got the rules into place, it was, you know, maybe only a matter of six months or a year until the feds uh, final, uh, did finally uh, issue the federal regulations uh, in 2016 when they went live. But the point is, at this point, if the regimes are largely similar, um, if you're a company seeking to raise funds through equity crowdfunding, I, it seems to me it makes sense to use the federal system where you have access to investors across the country, some of whom might like your uh, company, um, as opposed to the state system where you're more limited, unless the state system were to offer something different, um, which it, it does not really too much uh, or uh, to date. Um, so it doesn't surprise me terribly that the Colorado system has um, not really been used. But even so, I, I think, I, in, in my view, taking an international perspective, um, our federal system has not, it, it's, it's doing better than, uh, than the Colorado system, but it has not really taken off. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later when I uh, compare it with New Zealand. Thank you. Um, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about um, the accelerator and explain what you do there, first of all. And then second, is there an opportunity for entrepreneurs? Are they interested in equity crowdfunding? Is that something that you've heard them talking about? Or are there barriers that they perceived or else encounter? This is great. I get to... Uh give you a little commercial for Boomtown. Uh, Boomtown is a Boulder-based startup accelerator that helps startup companies uh, develop their businesses with the res resources that they need most. That includes a little bit of money uh, to pay expenses, uh, a world-class curriculum, an awesome group of very skilled mentors to help them with the businesses and a seasoned leadership team that's really passionate about entrepreneurs. We had 11 full-time uh, employees, including a CFO who runs our financial curriculum. I act as general counsel, so I, I participate in the, in the legal uh, curriculum. In addition to providing a, a great foundation for business success, the program culminates in, a, in an investor demo day where the teams uh, pitch their businesses to a group of accredited investors, meaning, uh, among others, individuals who are worth $200,000 or $300,000 or thousand rather than million dollar network. Um, an accelerator like Boom Count is a phenomenon that is really distinct from traditional fundraising. We, uh, we only provide a small amount of capital, uh, and that, but we advise on financing and try to help our companies uh, find it. Um, typically, Boom Count graduates don't immediately find VC financing. Uh, that comes later. Instead, they usually are tapping friends and family for a small initial round, typically a, a convertible note of three hundred to five hundred thousand uh, dollars from fairly small time angel investors. There's been a lot of interest among our companies in crowdfunding and we, we see it really as an adjunct or uh, an alternative to other financing. It has been uh, easier frankly for uh, for the companies to simply uh, find small investors when they when they uh, when they get started, and then going on to find uh, the larger uh, seed investors, finally the seed funds as investors. 
So there hasn't been a tremendous amount of interest in going through the motion of this document. It's just been too difficult this, uh, and this, with regard to uh, Colorado crowdfunding, the market of investors seems to be too small for the resources. I just wonder if they, if they had encountered any, any barriers that they, that, that, that they held you back. But it sounds like this might not be the right move if they're trying to just get off the ground. Maybe it would be for um, more a company that's been at it for a while. Well, so not I'm necessarily. Gonna... I think it can be the right if it were made easier. Uh, yeah, yeah. It can be the right group, especially for Colorado crowdfunding, if it's made easier, as opposed to going through the uh, you know the federal uh, the federal scheme. Uh, obviously, some changes have to be made. You know, talk about one of them being to uh, move away from the uh, small offering or uh, small amount. I'm glad you set that up because we're going to go into round two and we're going to talk about what some of the barriers were. And I would like to start with Carly on this one. Um, the way that it works is there's online sites that will make the offerings, like a starter type of site. They're all through our Colorado SEC offer. And Carl, you had a site there. And so tell us about it and also how it was to develop to do all of the, to get that platform ready for people and entrepreneurs to start making offers on it and what's, uh, and maybe identify what could have been easier for you. Yeah, the discussion has been about how difficult it is to do crowdfunding in Colorado. Um, the act specifically requires that if you're going to raise money, you have to list up, go on on website for a intermediary. And, and quite frankly, since I'm one of the two existing intermediaries in the state, and we just opened a couple of weeks ago after two and a half years of working on this, uh, to some degree to say that Colorado hasn't, you know, craft lighting hasn't worked here has is, is been based all on the fact there's been no choice. You, there was no vendor or intermediary who could help you go through the process. Uh, we encountered a wide number of issues. Most of those all had to do with the fact that the entire industry is aimed at and structured to work with angel investing, the accredited investors that were just mentioned. 97% uh, of the population, which is most of you here in the room, are non-accredited investors. And until crowdfunding occurred, you did not have an opportunity to invest in a Main Street business. It simply was too difficult, to practically impossible to do so. And when we went out to set up our platform, we found ourselves trying to interface with the capital industry, which uh, was designed and built to work with angel investors, not with large microfinance projects. And every step along the way, there was either no fit or a poor fit or the fits that worked over here would not work over here. And we ended up going through escrow agents, working through payment processing companies, different types of platforms. And time after time, we found that they simply did not care to work with us. Their price structures would not match up with us. Uh, they were technically incompatible with what we wanted to do. And it took uh, a long time of trial and error to find a combination of vendors that we could work with that would conform to the statute and offer a low cost approach to doing crowdfunding. And this is not technically the result or uh, fault of the statute or the way everything was drafted. It simply is the fact that basically everybody uh, designed their houses with four foot doors and we walk in at six foot tall and we have to bend over all the time in order to get through the door. It slowed us down, it impeded our progress and now that we're open, uh, we actually don't see any serious obstacles to expanding this rapidly over time and making this available as a common service uh, to small businesses in Colorado. Uh, we think that the hard part's behind us but it's still, uh, there's a little progress we can go through. We'll talk about some things later that might uh, make things a little easier. Uh, but uh, right now, I, I see it's all going forward. Eric, to put it simply, the intermediary is the website, the portal, if you will, that a company could display their offerings on and, and make their offering to the public saying, hey, I want to 
add to my yoga studio and you know do you want to invest in this and you've written it, you've written that we should maybe eliminate that middleman that intermediary so tell us what what you see is the hang up there and um, what how could we change that as part of our law well just to be clear I have suggested that the, the intermediary should not be mandatory for small smaller offerings I think that you know every time you add a player to the mix you're costing money when a Colorado business is raising 200 300 400 thousand dollars uh, they don't want to be spending a large part of that on compliance costs I think that even at that level, an intermediary can be very valuable. It's not, it is where the offering is posted, but the yoga studio, the hamburger uh, restaurant, whatever, can also use their own website to direct you to the intermediary. So the, the uh, advertising is out there. They can hand you a card as you're leaving the cash register um, and uh, tell you, direct you to the intermediary. But the intermediary has, uh, provides some real value, and if the cost is low enough, you know, I would think that even the smaller crowd funding would use the intermediary for vetting the investors for the compliance with the Colorado residence requirements, for perhaps receiving and transmitting the funds and keeping the appropriate records that an issuer may be unable or unwilling to do as accurately as the intermediary who's going to have experience doing it. But I think that for the smaller offers, that ought to be an option rather than a mandate. And, um, uh, but again, there's a, as Carl says, there's, there's a lot of steps that need to be done, and the intermediary can provide an awful lot of good value if the price is low enough. But... The question is whether it ought to be mandatory in the smaller offerings. I think it probably needs to be mandatory in the larger offerings, the way we've got it, although perhaps escrow requirements and other things can or should be changed. Andrew, um, can we, I'm sorry, Jack, can we, can we at least get rid of the intermediary and still follow the SEC rules that we have to, that they change that? making sure that we're everybody's who they say they are they live in the state they have certain income that sort of thing well i think we can i think we the question is whether we should i think we can because the the uh requirements are not so onerous that a company couldn't do it themselves um and i think that you know they Eric, you raised the question about the, the offering size. And I think it was Carl who had suggested in some emails that we, we traded that maybe another consideration would be the amount of the investment. So that if the amount that could potentially be lost were low enough, perhaps that would be able to dispense with it. Um, as a practical matter, I think about the fact that most of the businesses that would uh, attract local investment, meaning Colorado investment, are ones that would find those investors themselves, it would be from the affinity group, a customer, and so on. And so why couldn't we have, why couldn't we make it possible for the business itself to have an investor page so that they would be able to promote to their customers and everyone else, uh, their own company as a potential investment, driving those people directly to to their page on their website where they can sell them the uh, security. I don't think it'd be such a terrible thing. It would certainly make sense because people go to the website and have access to all the information they would need. The company would be responsible for complying with the other requirements. So I, I think that it's very possible. The other, the other part of the equation is the escrow fee, which um, just hasn't been available as far as the institutions who are qualified under our regulations are just not interested. Why can't we have 
uh, independent professionals act in that role in the same way as we have independent professionals act as escrow agents in uh, for proceeds of other offerings where we have a minimum act. I think it would uh, it would make it it would make it a lot easier. So those are just two of the things. I have some others as well. Okay. I'll get back to them. Okay. Um, one of the quick thoughts I have is just that maybe the intermediary um, also keeps it a little bit safe for the investor so that there's no um, bad apples out there who might rip off the investors. I don't know if that if it would make a difference to have an intermediary or have investor page, as you said. That would well, we have the escrow agent, too. That's that kind of and, and I'd add, and you know, Andrew is writing a paper on this about relationships. You know, if you're raising that small amount of money, whether it be from friends, family, business associates, that sort of stuff, and you're limiting the investor uh, risk by limiting the investment amount, you know, you've got the reputational issue that people are coming into your yoga studio, people are coming into your burger joint, People are using your services already, and these are the people who want you to get that new equipment. These are the people who are helping you grow. And I would think that, in my mind, crowdfunding is primarily local. I think Carl has written to that, to that effect. He, um, and, uh, he published a paper, In Order to Love You, I Gotta Know You, or something like that. And I think that's right. If people know that people are raising the capital, it's a lot safer for the investors. And it's it, it's much more democratized, I guess is the word that I'm using, where people are able to come in and um, become investors in their favorite yoga studio, their favorite hamburger joint, their favorite uh, health club, or whatever other business that is. So I would think that that minimizes the risk significantly. And I know Andrew has looked at that much more detail. <laughs> yes, and I'm wondering if we've been thinking inside the box, Andrew, and you've uh, seen how equity crowdfunding has worked in another country. So I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about how they're using crowdfunding in New Zealand and what we might learn from them. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, um, as I mentioned before, I think, uh, so I spent six months uh, this year in New Zealand talking to their uh, crowdfunding intermediaries, people that raise money this way, people in the government, regulators, um, and uh, and uh, just to see how things are going there because they have one of the oldest, being three years old, one of the oldest equity crowdfunding systems in the world, and they have a pretty comparable uh, population, economy, and uh, land mass size as Colorado, so it's pretty good comparison. Um, their securities laws, by and large, otherwise are very similar to ours. So I thought it would be a good uh, a good place to study what is actually going on there. And so New Zealand statute, which dates from 2013-14, is very similar to our Colorado Crowdfunding Act and the Jobs Act um, in in a couple of ways or in broad strokes. There is a two million dollar limit that companies can raise uh, each uh, 12 month period, and all uh, transactions must go through licensed intermediaries who get a, a license from the Division of Securities equivalent over there. But apart from that, the systems are actually very, very different. And New Zealand has a very, what I would call a simple and a liberal, meaning laissez-faire uh, kind of uh, law and set of regulations, whereas we in Colorado uh, and in uh, the Jobs Act have a somewhat uh, reasonably complex and uh, fairly regulated form of crowdfunding. Um, for example, here in Colorado, an issuer who wants to raise money must file a certain form with certain disclosures with the Division of Securities and provide this to investors. And then provide a quarterly, a quarterly report, also the Division of Securities, and to investors if they end up uh, raising the money. New Zealand has no mandatory disclosures. There's no form to file. In fact, there's no file. You don't file with the, with the government. Um, you file just with the intermediary that, uh, that has been licensed. And those intermediaries, those platforms, 
they have policies and procedures that they've developed and were approved by the securities regulator uh, for what should be uh, disclosed in what format, but it's pretty informal and depends on what makes sense. Here in Colorado, there's a $5,000 limit on the amount each person can invest in crowdfunding companies per year. New Zealand has no limit. You can, it's no limit, <laughs> no limit uh, crowdfunding. You can invest absolutely as much as you want. Uh, and in fact, people do sometimes invest $100,000, dollars $500,000 in a single company there. Um, so now look, we put these laws and regulations in place for a reason. We thought without them, we would see a lot of fraud and people losing their money on you know, businesses that don't have any promise. So New Zealand has put this to the test and here's my report. Um, it's working very, very well there. They have very low compliance costs. A lot of companies, relatively to us, a lot of companies uh, use this and have raised significant amounts of money. Colorado, with no activity, I can't really compare it, but I can compare the entire US in our federal system, the first year of crowdfunding versus New Zealand's first year of crowdfunding. I'm gonna scale it for the size of the economy. New Zealand is 1% size of the economy uh, of ours. New Zealand companies raised 30 times as much money as American companies. There were 13 times as many crowdfunded offerings. They were successful 80% of the time versus our 50% of the time. And in the history, the three year, in the three year history of crowdfunding in New Zealand, not one single uh, funded company turned out to be a fraud. And there was one company that went out of business recently. And this is not because New Zealanders are all honest. There's a pretty, you know, uh, there's a nice history of financial fraud there too. Okay, Trust me. I mean, I think that is, I was thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry to, to, yeah. to go on a little longer, but this is, um, so how do they do it? Yeah. This goes against what we thought could possibly work. Basically, the platforms, the intermediaries, all the pressure is on them. If they allow fraudulent or poor companies onto their site, not only will they lose business because investors will come back a second time, but they'll lose their license. And so that's the way that the government can sort of uh, keep track of things. And in fact, these platforms are very, very strict. They, they reject, the leading platform there rejects 98% of the companies that ask to list there because they know their whole business depends on reputation. There's some other things I can talk about, but um, we have one step in the right direction here, which is that accredited investors are exempt from that $5,000 cap and who's going to be the people investing 100,000, 200,000 at a time after doing some careful due diligence that the rest of us can rely upon? It's probably going to be accredited investors. So we have one step in the right direction. I think there's more that we can do. Thank you. I actually have a follow-up question. I wonder if you could say what, what types of businesses um, are they? Main Street businesses? Are they startups with legs that hopefully uh, want to grow at a quick rate? Maybe sell at the end. What types of businesses are using this? There's um, a, a couple of um, that have sort of, um, you know, outsized presence, a couple of areas. One, brewer, breweries. The people in Wellington want to support their local brewery. The people in Auckland want to support their local brewery. I think maybe the people in Fort Collins and, uh, you know, Boulder feel the same way. We can find out breweries do very well. Social enterprises, like there's a, an app developer that wants to put together local organic farmers with people who want to buy their produce. Um, social kind of enterprises like that. And then um, anything you like, like, I mean, like some of you were saying, you know, anything with a real local flavor, anything that the, the Kiwis could really get behind, um, they, they would like to support. So I, I could see that easily translate to the Colorado context. Yeah, how about it? You know, when you mentioned uh, the fact that the businesses turned out not to be frauds, which is great. But what we don't know is how satisfied the investors were with their investment or what kind of return. <clears throat> I can appreciate the, let's say, fair attitude toward disclosure, but it really is the mission of all of our security regulation. And I like, let's say, fair, but I also like people to get into things with their eyes open, having had an opportunity to evaluate <clears throat> all of the facts. So as much as I would like to see less uh, restrictions on or no you know, on intermediaries or no cash 
or not requiring them or easing up on the escrow agent qualification, uh, I think that the uh, disclosure is very important. Yeah, yeah. Issuers are still subject to uh, Rule 10b-5 federally and Section 12, and so on. So they, and I think those are good things. So they should do that. Easy for startups, and that's one of the reasons why I like crowdfunding for boom town companies because the startups is very easy. They don't have much of a business to talk about. They can talk about uh, the risk factors of all startup enterprises. And uh, that's about a you know six pages that I've already written and attached that very easily. That's so, the securities lawyer in you, Jack, and I absolutely <laughs> absolutely agree. And yeah. securities division has got form CF two crowdfunding form two, which is similar to their form for the limited offering registration, which effectively is a fill in the blank disclosure form. It asks questions and you respond to those questions. And it forms a good basis for disclosure. It's not one a securities lawyer would use. We'd uh, write it in our own words and known language and that sort of stuff. But from the crowd funder perspective, it is a decent, if not good, disclosure form that can easily be complete, found, it can a little more difficult to find than I like to think, Jerry, but but it can easily be completed once it's been found. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think disclosure is extremely important. I don't believe that the intermediary should be responsible for that disclosure, uh, but I think that's putting too much burden on the intermediary. I think the intermediary can, in fact, vet the ones that come to it. doesn't have to take everybody who walks through the door, but the ones that I am sure that in the 98% that the intermediary rejects in New Zealand, there's probably a number of valid, good businesses that just didn't say the right words at the right time. Well, to the point, uh, I think that any system that rejects 98% of businesses is highly dysfunctional and should be scrapped and started over again. <laughs> um, right now, uh, the prior to crowdfunding and the wealth discrimination I mentioned earlier, 100% uh, of the investments were made by wealthy accredited investors and they only invested in 2% of the businesses that applied. I mean that 98% of the businesses, regardless of how good they were, were getting rejected because they weren't meeting the criteria of this elite number of people uh, who represent only 3% of the population. That's the reason why we passed crowdfunding. I mean, it wasn't because the angel investors needed one more tool in their portfolio in order to figure out what they were going to put their money in. We need it for the average person on the street, all of you, to have the ability to put money in your local coffee shop or your local grocery store or something like that. So any chokehold or any, any clues point in the system that chokes it down to 2%, I automatically give it half, and we'll just move on to another issue. Uh, I think we do need disclosure. I think that that disclosure has to be made, whether it's made through an intermediary or through participation of the office first before they go out. It doesn't really matter as long as the disclosure has to be made in, in the documents. The role of the intermediary uh, is still an open question to me whether it, it's needed or not. I'm speaking as an intermediary. Uh, but uh, the thing is, the steps you have to go through in order to properly create your documents and tell your story and build your crowd and get this message out to everybody, most businesses don't have those skills. They don't have that infrastructure in place, and it's going to be costly and complex for them to go through that process. If the intermediary can provide that service at a cost lower and more efficiently than what a business can do on their own, then good for them. If they can't, then yes, we should allow the business to do it themselves. Um, and uh, so I do see a potential, as Herrick has suggested, that on certain raises it might be optional rather than mandatory participation of an intermediary but those businesses still have to do all the fundamental process to, to go out and tell their story accurately uh, to the community. So I'm, I'm interested in things we can do to make it easier, but right now I still don't see the rules and the regs as being the problem. I think that we're, we're faced with a, a population that believes that simply because you post up on the internet, everybody's gonna give you money. Uh, there's no prep, there's no building a crowd, 
They don't know where they're going. Uh, there's no point in going national if you don't have a crowd locally. So how are you going to gain a relationship with somebody in Oregon? I got a, a pitch for one out of Pittsburgh. It invest my brew pub. I don't know you, and I'll never drink in your brew pub. So why would I invest in your brew pub? But uh, I try to cater as many local brew pubs as I can. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like. I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's. I, I think that uh, what we're seeing is that we had a default that people weren't capable of making their own investment decisions. We realized that went too far in terms of consumer protection. We're trying to roll that back. We don't want to go too far. We still may need to go a little bit further to loosen this whole thing up. But I don't see the intermediary as being the largest issue. I think it's just generally a lack of knowledge and a lack of systems that are available for people to use. And we'll get there sooner or later, uh, slower than I want, but we'll get there. I wanted to add something with regard to intermediaries because I think that uh, I think they could actually do more. I, I am in favor of eliminating them in certain circumstances, optionally, uh, but making them available to actually do more. Right now, we have people who would be interested in doing offerings who are really uh, incompetent. Uh, Eric, you mentioned the question and answer format of the, uh, of the disclosure document. Yes, many people can do it themselves, but there are others that would have no idea what to do and probably shouldn't do it. I would very much like to see professional services step into the void to help people do their do what's needed in the way of, uh, of disclosure, and it could well be intermediaries. Um, right now, we don't allow intermediaries to uh, accept an interest in the companies that they're serving, uh, even on a fixed basis, whether or not the offering is success successful. So that's a, a you know a missed opportunity for uh, to hire <coughs> an intermediary to, to provide services uh, at a at a low risk lower risk uh, fee because it's based upon a give up some equity. Uh, we don't uh, we don't allow intermediaries to do any kind of promotion at all. So yes. this runs into the broker dealer license. Like, even if they're not providing investment advice or, or really uh, uh, doing, doing much, they, they have no ability to do any marketing. They don't really have any marketing services, even if they're uh, not providing advice. There's no marketing services for these sorts of companies. I think we need well, to ease up a little bit. You want me right into my next question okay. about marketing because I'm, I'm asking, have we, has, has there been marketing? Do people even know that this is an option for them? And if the intermediary cannot go out and hype the sites or the products, how do we? How does it? How does it get marketed? How do people find out about it? I mean, I'm trying to think of like how did Kickstarter just take off the way it did? And you know what I mean? Like some hype happened. <laughs> Let me take that question because one thing I think we did do right, and everybody's involved is we intentionally designed the intermediary to be the lowest possible cost service to help a business do it yourself as far as a fundraiser. We intentionally took the broker dealer out who had basically taken themselves out of the marketplace by being too expensive and not addressing the segment of the market. We said, here's a way for a business with a little help from an intermediary to go out and raise their own money. And so we intentionally did not allow you to take an equity position. We intentionally would not allow you to participate you know, by commission, all these things, and that keeps the cost down. And I, I'm concerned, and I've had this discussion with lots of people, about if we start allowing these kinds of fees to come in, this will bloat the thing back up, and it'll start looking like a broker-dealer, and we'll be back to the 2% getting services. Uh, an intermediary is allowed to generally promote the platform, so it isn't like we totally gagged. I can promote crowdfunding, I can promote the benefits of investing local, I can invest all that. I simply can't take one of the listings that's on the platform and go, you should invest in this. I can't be an advocate at that level. And, and that's fine and that's appropriate because I'm not an investment advisor and everybody should make an individual decision on whether this is a good or bad investment for them based upon their own personal criteria. So it would be wrong for me to make any kind of statement in any form of recommendation. 
That doesn't mean I can't tell you that investment craft is better than everything else out there, because it is. Uh, and I think that we're going to get there eventually uh, once people see some success stories and they start seeing this as an alternative to what was the only choice they had before. Uh, and once we get there, we'll see the changes we're looking for. Can we um, all talk a little bit about who the uh, entrepreneurs might be, who, who, are, who might be interested in this um, these two years later after the law has been in effect? I go back to what the legislature said when they adopted the crowdfunding act. Startups and small businesses needing capital. <clears throat> That's where I think the primary target is. I think that the primary, from, from my uh, looking around and seeing what the small businesses and startups are looking for, you know, you, they're, they're looking in that two to three to five hundred thousand dollar range, and it, Securities regulation has always been a pendulum between, as Jerry was saying, protecting the investor and encouraging capital formation. The best way to protect the investor is to prohibit capital formation. And the best way to achieve capital formation is throw out all the rest of the rules. Well, there's some place in between. And the problem I see with the Colorado Crowdfunding Act is that the same rules apply to the $100,000 offering as apply to a million dollar offering. And if you've got audited financial statements, apply to the $2 million offering. And I question whether that is appropriate. I think that there should be a different set of rules, an easier set of rules, kind of what we're talking about, that apply to the smaller offerings, that do contemplate that the startup or the small business that the legislature is trying to help can do it on their own if they want to, if they're smart enough to. If Carl, uh, if it Invest Local, if CFAX, if some other platform can provide them value added, I think that is great. But I don't think it ought to be mandatory if the business can choose, chooses to do it itself and is able to accomplish it successfully. Granted, if they don't accomplish it successfully, we've got the Division of Securities Enforcement staff that might be knocking at the door, which is the risk of any capital formation. But I really think that we need to have a different focus for that two to three to five hundred thousand dollar range than we do for the larger offerings. I saw the secure. I saw the commissioner squirming his seat when he said that the New Zealand. They don't have any disclosure at all. Is there a happy medium? Is there, a, is there, is there, is there something that we can um, say that might help uh, urge some new rules? <laughs> well, no. So let me let me make, let me make uh, two points because I think I think I uh, left a misimpression. Um, it's one of the platforms is so selective that it only accepts two okay. percent of its applicants. There are other platforms in the country. In fact, it's a pretty vibrant market. And one of them, another one, takes the total opposite view and will take almost anybody who's willing uh, to, uh, you know, give it a good faith effort uh, and, you know, listen to some advice from the platform. So uh, the ones that don't make it there do show up. Um, yeah. Don't don't work. So that's that's part one. And then so we, we, uh, and then just which companies might might uh, you know profitably use this? Really, it's it's sort of a twofer for consumer com brand companies like you know brewery or something like that because you encourage brand loyalty at the same time as getting some capital. When the person goes to the store, they're more likely to pick the six pack of the company they partially own. He's exactly what I thought was expected when they wrote the law. But there's still yeah. time. There's still yeah. time. And so then finally on, on the on the disclosure, as a matter of fact, there's a tremendous amount of disclosure, careful disclosure, deep financial disclosure, not mandated on any form, um, but as each platform in its business judgment thinks would be useful to those investors. And the platform's broad policies for doing this must be approved by the securities regulator. So it's true there's no mandatory disclosure. It's also true there's a whole lot of disclosure. Yeah, I, I think that the, the current disclosure requirements are very minimal. Uh, we typically would expect to see in an offering document far more information than is required by the state. The approval process I don't consider to be painful or slow or, or costly. I don't think seeing those issues. Uh, I think it's just a, it's a matter of that uh, 
they were all told there was only one door and there was no doors. So. So I think this would be a good time to open it up to questions and see what if we've enlightened anybody. <laughs> they have some uh, follow-up questions to the topics that we've talked about. Um, May I start with a question? Yes. Um, may I see a show of hands of people in the room that were familiar with this crowdfunding program before this program today? And how many are students? Good. Um, does anyone have suggestions as to how the work can best get out if you haven't heard of the program? Okay. I mean, yes, sir. I, I think, I mean, it's very interesting to listen to three attorneys and Carl. I'm an attorney. But yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am a small business owner, and I work with a whole bunch of other small business owners. I've been in the startup community for probably 10 years in various capacities. Mm. And the reality is we all need money. The process that you've just described as somewhat frustrating for somebody that needs money is not a barrier to want to pursue crowdfunding. What you've laid out is a process that needs to be followed, adopted, and done diligently, but it is not so difficult that I'm going to turn away from the opportunity to raise money. The challenge for crowdfunding, in my opinion, is exactly that hand show just now. If you gather the majority of small business owners from any local town into a room and ask them what their sources of capital were for expansion, they would tell you friends, family, and the bank. I would be astounded if 10% even understood that they could access this thing called crowdfunding to support their current business proposition and its expansion. It simply isn't well communicated from the state level down into small business communities. That's the biggest challenge in my mind. I, I would respond that we're, we're kind of in a dilemma. Without uh, operating intermediary platforms, there's nothing for the state to promote because there's no no route for them to go to market. And the platforms are just starting to promote themselves because they're just now in operation. But I, I see some of this problem disappearing now that the platforms are, we got two of them up us and Eric who's somewhere in the room back there. Um, and uh, there'll be more word out there about it. And, and the thing that's going to sell quickest is a successful capital raise. Uh, once somebody sees somebody raise a half a million, quarter million dollars uh, from a different group of investors, which are people in their local community, then a lot of people are going to take a strong look at that and consider doing that as well. We have two, uh, one question and one comment from Grand Junction. Uh, the comment is one way to get the word out is more programs such as this one. I saw an article in the Grand Junction Center. And then the question from Andy in Grand Junction is, are there requirements regarding the legal structure of a business to crowd? Uh, the answer to that would be no. Um, it could be a little liability company. It could be a corporation. It could be a partnership. Uh, depending on how you structure it, probably could do a securities offered by a sole proprietorship. It may be debt type security, but uh, there's no limitation on the structure of the business whatsoever. It, it could also be a nonprofit that has a project or program that's structured as a sustainable entity. So essentially any form of entity could take advantage of this as long as they could show a mechanism uh, for return to an investor. And any entity formed under Colorado law. Yeah. So we've been talking about equity primarily, but there's also the debt option. Do you think that some of the businesses are shying away from giving away equity or not thinking about that and they're really not aware of debt on the same thing as non profit? My experience has been that most small business owners are very apprehensive <coughs> about giving up ownership control in their company. So they're reluctant to sell stock, which would give people the right to vote. There are lots of alternatives that are available to them from non-voting stock um, to uh, use of promissory notes, debt instruments, uh, revenue share, which is uh, a non-voting uh, right to participate in the gross revenues of the company. 
Uh, so there's lots of options that are both non-dilutive and uh, non-controlled functions. But most small businesses aren't familiar with all these options, and there's a lot of education on how they can take advantage of them. Uh, we're also, when we structure deals, we're commonly uh, combining rewards in the form of price discounts for the products and services of the business, uh, which often are positioned as the most, uh, the highest motivator and setting for them to make the investment with any equity component being a secondary concern and secondary value so that the, uh, the investor is looking to immediate tangible benefit that they may get from a reward. And then the, the kicker icing on the cake may be an equity component or something else. I think the timing is absolutely perfect and it's this generation, not my generation, who absolutely require lateral relationships. And if you look at all the things happening in society with the millennial generation, it's just a matter of this becoming more evident in some of the social media platforms, not by the intermediary, but by the people. Because this generation being constrained by debt and less security in the job market is making lateral relationships across the world. So I'm encouraged by this, and I think it would behoove the state and the regulatory agencies to be really uh, outgoing or more forthcoming about trying to form these relationships, especially for at-risk, underserved communities, and especially for the type of people that this generation of people look for in serving. So is anybody going to volunteer the office securities to give me a grant? <laughs> I knew he was going to laugh at that. Too. Uh, I had some recommendations on how to get the word out. Uh, I currently use an app called Robinhood. It's not sure how many people are familiar with the, an app that brokerage, you can buy, sell stocks, commission. So it's really shaking up the um, brokerage industry. But with Robinhood, the, I found out about it through a family member. He found out about it through a friend. And I found that with Robinhood, the word of mouth is a huge part that is driving the growth of it. And uh, I think with Robinhood, the the app is really well designed. It's very user friendly, it's very simple. They have a, an accompanying website that is also really well designed, it's mobile friendly. And a lot of people, especially the younger generations, they're using mobile devices more so than they are desktops. And so if, if I, I think if you really want to grow as, as fast as you can, you really want to make sure that you have a website that's mobile friendly and my biggest recommendation would be to have an app that is really well designed, it looks great, you know, simple, and where people can go on there and look at investment opportunities um, in a very simplified way. Uh, another way to get the word out would also be for, um, as one of the gentlemen up there said, like the business could put on their business card, you know, just a little snippet that says, invest in us here, or, or something like that. If you could, make it easy for um, customers to know that it is possible and then just forward them to your website or tell them about the app, then people can go to that app, find you on there, find what you're offering, find how they can invest in you. And uh, I think that could really, you know, grow through word of mouth. If it looks good, it's simple, people like it, they'll tell people about it, they'll tell their friends and family, and, and then people will start to know that you can actually do this. Um, my last point is, uh, when I came here today, I had no idea about this crowdfunding. And I, I think it's really cool. So um, I definitely can, can see a future with something like this. I think if you were to get it mobile friendly and on an app, that it could really grow pretty well. Well, uh, two comments on that one. I totally agree with you. We have to be mobile. Uh, ours is not mobile friendly yet. It's mobile tolerant at best uh, today. Uh, but the, the point you make is that businesses can promote themselves. This is one of the advantages of crowdfunding. 
is that for the first time, a business can stand up and go, look, I'm raising money. Uh, they don't have to restrict who they talk to or where they say that they're raising money. They can tell generally anybody who's a resident of the state of Colorado, uh, come on down, look at my website, put it on the card, <coughs> put in your uh, receipt at the cash register. All those are open to them now to tell people that they are looking for local money to come in and support them. And you couldn't do that before. So it, it's, you know, it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. I would add one of the, one of the issues that's got to be remember and um, uh, this is where the lawyer sometimes provides the services that you've got securities regulation at both the federal and the state level you got to comply with part of it is ensuring that your investors are local they're Colorado residents um, but part of it has to do with how things get advertised the uh, legends you put on there this is not available to us resident outside of Colorado Vetting the investors as they're coming in. Yeah, you know, it's not just uh, put a, a crowdfunding offering on your uh, Facebook or uh, some other social media file. There's a lot of steps that the issuers got to take, which the on you know, and this is where an online intermediary at a reasonable cost can provide a valuable service. Um, but yeah, Carl is absolutely right. There's nothing once you've undertaken a crowdfunding offering. Forget those old private placement rules where you cannot advertise the offering. You uh, have to have pre-existing personal business relationships with your investors and those other things that the lawyers are going to tell you about in Regulation D. Um, this is open to everyone in the community in Colorado, but if everyone's got to be vetted as they're coming in with their $5 or $500 or $5,000. <coughs> Yeah, and, and definitely I agree with that, that you have to navigate through all the rules and regulations. Um, and, and I forgot to mention that the, the people or organization who would, I would think, that would develop the app would be like the intermediary. And, yeah. And then they can promote the platform. They can't recommend any, any particular companies, but they can recommend the platform. There was one uh, quick question from the web. Um, just to clarify, can crowdfunding be used for debt financing for bonds or only for equity and stocks? It can be used for debt financing, uh, debt, promissory notes, bonds, uh, debentures, um, call it what you will, are a security. Um, federal and state law both have held it that way. Um, not always uh, a security, but in this context it would be, and yes, it's available for any sort of securities offering. So how much more does this cost the business to actually invest more or less? Because wouldn't it make more sense with the scope of a lot of loan? Spending all the extra money. <laughs> okay. You, you made an assumption yeah. which could get you in trouble. Okay. Which is you're assuming you can get a loan. Okay, so if you're a startup business and under the current regulatory structures for banks, they're not supposed to engage in activities that involve risk. Uh, essentially a bank today is offering services to help you manage your money, charging a fee for doing that. They're not supposed to give you a loan if there's a high degree of risk or any degree of risk associated with it. So classically, as a startup business for the first three to five years, you're not eligible for bank financing unless you're using it to buy equipment that you can use as collateral. So if you can get bank financing, it's typically going to be cheaper and quicker than going through a crowdfunding campaign. Similarly, people say, well, I could go get angel funding. I said, if you get angel funding, go get it, <laughs> okay? Because uh, it probably also will be quicker. But if you can't get it, crowdfunding is supposed to be filling the gap between the banks and you. So how much would it cost the company to general crowdfunding? We are estimating that between the cost of personnel, cost of marketing and everything, mm -hmm. you probably will spend out of pocket and indirectly kind of up to $50,000 on a campaign. The smaller the campaign, the lower the cost, but you start trying to raise a couple million dollars, 50,000 is cheap. And so most of that's coming out of your pocket. That includes, that includes our fee, the escrow fee, your cost of your marketing company, whoever you're using, your own time, your own staff. That's a turnkey everything. Wouldn't it be great if you could just put a page on your website to drive your customers? So I uh, 
Eric asked me to come. My name is John Eckstein. I've been a securities lawyer for 42 years. Uh, my claim to fame is I was at the Morning Green Great American Beer Festival. And I didn't have to wear a suit and all that stuff. But I don't wear a suit. Uh, I was on the board of advisors for the Securities Commission of the PDP. We passed a lot of laws for Bill Telling the commissioner that we gave a lot of powers that probably people didn't wish he had today. Uh, I just finished a uh, tour around the uh, giving CLE programs to the lawyers in Rango, Fort Collins, Springs, Summit County, uh, Grand Junction. I'll be up in Greeley. They always are talking to the general practitioner lawyers about securities law, so they know how not to make mistakes. Because often, if they practice in the securities area, they don't have insurance for that, and they're going in their house and customer <coughs> careers. Okay. I'm also the lawyer for the Rockies Venture Club, if you've ever heard of that. I did the work on their fund, so I can say that. There, I do, nowadays, I do. <coughs> I represent investment bankers, broker dealers. Uh, I don't represent. I don't really work in the crowdfunding area, but I certainly invest in little startups. I've been on the boards of little startups. There are four lawyers trained up there. I'm a lawyer trained. One of my philosophies, whether you like it or not, is if I think crowdfunding, you should be able to do it without having to hire a lawyer. You may not like that lawyers in the room, but if it's so complicated that a, that a grocery store, can't go out and get 200 people in the neighborhood to loan them $200,000 to a note that they find out and a set of emails out. It's too complicated. Okay. This should not, I was present at the creation of this statute. I advised three different lobbying groups, trade associations, uh, Bruce Guild, might have, might have been in there, and some other things. I don't have a problem with the disclosure rules at all. I mean, you could write them differently or not. It's complicated, though. It's just so complicated that the general practice lawyers, somebody comes in the door, every place they ask me about drug money, and every place I tell them, don't do it. It's too complicated unless you're a securities lawyer. Now, so here we've got a situation where it's too complicated for the regular lawyers, who could be relatively inexpensive. Because there aren't securities lawyers in most towns I talk to. There's one up there. In I think it's go both ways, so. but it's got to be simple. I think if Jerry had a rule, not the statute. If Jerry's got the power. The commissioner's got the power to write a rule. The simplifies within the statute for smaller. I like that idea. I have talked to. I like. I'm a person who believes in intermediaries. I the whole. Uh, distributed ledger technology, blockchain, Bitcoin stuff, they're trying to eliminate intermediaries. But this is a regulated activity at the federal and state level, raising money for investors. I represent investors. You've got to have intermediaries in there that can be regulated, that, that someone can pull the license, to, that there's some control, or not control, but you've got to follow some rules that they, I believe the government can keep an eye on. So this is not a coin offering or anything like that. If that's making sense to people, I'm trying here. Yeah. But uh, I also went around and talked to accounting firms after uh, Dodd Frank came in, and again after the Jobs Act. The accountants have asked, "Should we get involved?" No way. There's too much work, too much risk for not enough to pay. It's sad, and I agree with you. It's fifty thousand dollars, but it's sad it costs fifty thousand dollars to raise three hundred thousand dollars. That's a sad commentary. It's got to be a better way. Of course, I believe there should be more than two of the media areas, so we have some competition. <laughs> but we've only got the two or the one or the two right now. So I think we're on a, the right track. I think this program is a good program. I think we need to focus. I don't. I, I hope you have an escrow agent because all the people I know don't want to get involved in this. They can't make enough money doing it. But if the intermediary will pick up the paper ball, we can get this done in Colorado. I really. Do. I don't know if that's what you want me to say or not, but I think we can do this today. I don't know if it agrees with what doesn't agree with you. But I'd like to see something so simple that with the rules and the intermediary, a regular lawyer can form the entity and then you can go off and do the thing and have to have securities insurance or something. So that's, we 
can get there with that, but I don't want to go back to the legislature. And it's so hard to, to work that. It's expensive to do that. I think sorry, right, we could do this without changing the statute. Sorry. Okay. 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 Yeah, this is Eric Hansen. Um, I'm one of two authorized intermediaries in the state of Colorado. And there really isn't anything wrong with the way that between Carl and I, we collaborate together often. And we figured out the whole escrow agent problem. So it's, it's gone. So we don't need to talk about it. But I do have some other things I'd like to ask you. If you were a young entrepreneur and you wanted to get into business for yourself, and you found a franchise that you wanted to have, but the franchise costs you $100,000, but it has a really high track record of success. Would you do that when you got out of college if you could beat the franchisor's qualifications? But how would you get the money to start that franchise? That's one example of how we, the interme intermediaries, can help you because we can go back to the franchisor because they already know who your crowd is. Am I making any sense? So there's some important things that are kind of being, being either avoided or, or just not being brought up. You're only going to be successful in crowdfunding, and I think Carl would agree with me on this, is if you either have a crowd or you go to an intermediary that has a crowd. So that's the, that's the nuts and bolts. Some of the other things in here, you know, we're talking about eliminating the need for an intermediary. And, you know, I really don't care if it's, and Carl, I think you and I have talked about this, it doesn't matter whether we're required or not. The bottom line is intermediaries have found, we found that we can't just be a place where we gather up your documents and sort them out and read through your business plan. We have to provide a wide range of services. And those services are everything from pointing the young entrepreneur to the right person to publish and, and get the word out on your campaign. Because you're not going to know who that person is. So we have to have, we literally have to make a tool bag, which we've done, by the way. If we come to you and say, for you're using us, these are the services we're going to provide. Because as a young business person, your job is not to go through and understand how to fill out all the paperwork. Your job is not going out and marketing your campaign. Your job is to run your business. So the intermediary supplies a huge range of services beyond posting stuff on something up on the website. So I don't think you're ever going to get away with it. I, mean, I would like to a small business that only needs $100,000 could, could not use an intermediary. I think it's a great idea, but I think in reality, it's a fallacy. It can't happen. Yes? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like you see a service company or something like a service of some sort. Um, would you be like offering, or why would you not be willing to offer your service in some case if you're confident that you could, through your company, you could acquire funding for like a young entrepreneur? Would you be yeah, able to do that? Yeah, so, so uh, there's multiple answers to that question. It's a good question. But the, the biggest issue is starting with the statute doesn't allow us to take a commission. And, and there's a reason for that because it would bias your willingness to take on a campaign listed on your platform. There's too much of a chance, and Eric and I are not in full agreement on this, so this is all fine, but um, there's too much of a chance you would take on a bad deal and list it because you think the upside's gonna pay your fee. And it's also gonna contribute over time to the cost of the fee, or the fee is gonna elevate if you're gonna do it on, on a contingent fee basis. And, and there's a, all kinds of things that start to creep into this that are unintended consequences that actually would defeat the whole purpose of what we're trying to do. Uh, we we're talking about $50,000. That's at all cost of everybody involved, including your own team and your own campaign. Our current rack rate is $5,000, and we're actually 
because of the ability to charge investors a fee to go through our process. We're even thinking about doing away with the fee to the issuer altogether. Uh, and it's only because we're able to split our fee structure within the business model um, that uh, we're able to go down that path. Uh, but anything that contributes cost to the middle, and I totally agree, John, I'd like for somebody to walk in and be able to do all this. I think we'll get there. It may be a year away yet before this all gets simplified. I can go, here's three ESCO people and three of this and three of this, and they're all low cost. What we found along the way is that everybody's got the wrong price, the wrong structure, that we can't fit up with them. And that's why it's taken us long to get where we want to go. But uh, you want to keep this absolutely a do-it-yourself model. You want to keep it as simple as possible. You want to be avoid anything that allows cost to creep in because that will put you right back to where we were before, and that's where we don't want to be. Yeah, just, I see those barriers to entry like, in itself. Well, to, to the point, we've had a lot of people come to us and go, I can't afford all that. And we are looking at new structures, uh, including funds and, and people who might bridge finance or be the seed round that would enable you to cover the cost of the crowdfunding campaign. It's true that a lot of businesses can't jump immediately into that as a first round tier because it's too complex and too costly for them to do that. Mr. Okay. Yes, no, uh, yeah, I do actually. Um, uh, just a couple quick comments. One is when we first started looking at crowdfunding, our concern really was with the retail investors and opening up. Um, startup companies to retail investors. As we all know, most startups fail, right? Two thirds of startups fail. So if you're looking at someone who's making $60,000 a year, you really want them to be investing $10,000 in a company that has, you know, 60% chance of failure. And um, we were, I guess we were fairly effective in protecting investors in Colorado in that. <laughs> no, no one lost any money. <laughs> So, so part of my job is done, but uh, but I, I don't I don't think that's the right answer, and that's why we're doing this. Um, I, I have to say I, I agree with Jack. I mean, I, my preference would, would be it would be great to be able to uh, have people not have to hire a lawyer to do crowdfunding in Colorado. And I think the people who know our form, crowdfunding form, the disclosure document, it, it, it is it is easy to fill out. And it gives you a roadmap as to what information you need to disclose to your investors. Um, I guess I, I heard two things today. Well, one from Jack, and then two things. One is do away with it in the media area, at least on the lower level offerings, and, or put more emphasis on the intermediary and, and less disclosures. So um, <coughs> they're, they're both interesting thoughts. Um, you know, there's always the concern with the, you know, eliminating the intermediary and that. They provide a, a crucial function in terms of if someone knows how to make beer, it doesn't necessarily mean they know how to handle uh, stock shareholders or complying with our act. Those are two different things, so it's important. But um, I, you know, uh, just let me say it, this: this was really enlightening and a fun time to hear these four uh, smart guys talk about crowdfunding. Um, and, I, and I'll just let uh, Monica wrap up. I just uh, want to say thank you for you uh, all, uh, Eric, Andrew, Jack, um, for helping us understand what, why it's been a slow process, but maybe next year at this time we'll be talking about all the companies that um, have listings and offerings on at least the two sites, but I know there were five that were planned, right? So there were some others. There's just two that are up and running, but maybe they'll be more and and there will be less barriers and more excitement we'll try to you know get the story out so um really thank you uh that was great great information i was taking notes myself so following up with stories <laughs> thank you everyone for coming i think this is awesome. <laughs>
And on page seven, the last page of your agenda is an email address for further questions and comments. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.